I'm Sabina Grimm. And I am Reinhardt Grimm. We are the five times great grandchildren of those famous story collectors from the past, the Brothers Grimm. Now we've rather followed on in the family tradition and in normal times you could find us out and about on the streets collecting people's stories and assessing the state of our nation. But in this time of corona crisis we aren't able to collect stories in the usual way but luckily we have a technological genius in the face of Miss Merkel up our sleeve. Yes, Miss Merkel here, but luckily we're able to collect the stories using Zoom technology. And so, in early April 2020, just two or three weeks into the lockdown, we were able to speak to people from all across the nation. Whereabouts are you today? Whereabouts are you based? Edward. I'm in Surbiton. I'm in East London, Wanstead, East London. I'm in Hackney. I'm in Bounds Green in North London. Uh, Deptford, South London. Croydon, Thornton Heath. I'm in Peckham. I'm in uh, Bougie Stoke Newington in Hackney. I am currently at home in North Dorset. I'm in Dundee. We've collected some extraordinary stories that show us how people are feeling, what they're thinking at this strange time we find ourselves in. Here's a selection. We hope they give you some solace, bring you some joy, and a real sense that we really are all in this together. A nice thing that happened early, early on was um, I went into um, Lidl to buy some groceries and I forgot my bank card. And I was trying to count out with the money I had on me what to get. And I didn't have, have enough, so I decided I had to just put everything down and go home and get my bank card. But a man in this, in this car park came racing up to me and said, are you short of money? And he offered to buy all my groceries. And that's when I realised we're living in a strange time. And I was like, no, it's okay, I'm just going to go home. I've just forgot my bank cards. I've just forgot everything. So I'm just going to go home and start again. But that's when I, I, think I was aware that things were strange. But it was such a nice gesture. He came rushing out to, to do it. And I was like, hmm. It's been five days now since the glasses went missing. I was watching something on my laptop, a bit like I am now watching you. Um, it was a very interesting story about mermaids, I believe. Ooh. Yes, um, that live in the Bermuda Triangle. But obviously I was engrossed, I know. It just gets more and more mysterious. Yes. And I remember looking at the clock on my laptop at about 11 o'clock. I was starting to feel a little bit tired. I had had a drink. Well, obviously, who hasn't at this point? <laughs> I was lying in bed watching this tale about mermaids and I remember feeling sleepy and then closing my eyes and then remembering I had my glasses on. So I took them off and that was the last time I saw them. Huh. It's been Gosh. five days. Where are my glasses? This um, quarantine has made me think uh, quite a lot about family. Mm. And uh, firstly, my own family. So my mum is in a care home, uh, but it's very nearby. And obviously visits got stopped to the care home um, a few weeks ago. So I haven't seen her. I've just been able to telephone her. And um, yesterday, just out of the blue, I got a phone call from the care home. Um, and they had arranged for me to have a window visit. So I could go to the care home, which has got lovely grounds. It's just up the road and stand there, you know, a good distance away from the window, but wave and smile and everything else. And they brought my mum to the window, which was really nice. I tempted to video it, but unfortunately failed there. Don't talk in a video and at the same time, not, not good. But um, it means I can do it again. So that's, that's fantastic. Because as well as it being lovely to see my mum, um, it was lovely to see the carers and to say what a marvelous job they're doing, because it was really, really obvious at that short visit that they were really, really doing a fantastic job. So that was, that was brilliant, because that's not easy. And then there are the other families, the other families that we don't call families like our own families. But um, the first of all has been my immediate neighbors, which have been brilliant. They, they're, they're lovely people. So on one side, I've got a drama teacher and her daughter, um, and her livelihood has just gone out the window, to be honest, because she's a freelance drama teacher. On the other side, we've got a young family, two young children and a mum and dad, and, and their dad is an artist, and that's quite fascinating as well. But we've been operating a bag system, 
um, carrier bag system. So uh, on one side, the children side, uh, I've been putting over a bag over the fence with little games and craft activities. It's the old teacher in me coming out, you see. And uh, I I'm afraid it probably has lumbered the parents a few times because I've put in like cake cases and stuff like that, cake decorations. <laughs> So I did apologise for that. You know. um, but the other morning, that, from that side, I came downstairs and opened the door to my porch, and uh, here's a prop, and I found this little card, and I'm going to show them Aww. a vase of daffodils. And as soon as it became clear there was going to be a lockdown, my boyfriend said, um, Obviously, we need to make a blanket fort speak easy. I said, yeah. To be honest, initially, I was like, yeah, I guess, I guess that's a great idea. Um, <laughs> I was mainly just like, Lord, how long is there going to be a lockdown for? But he was really committed. And then because he was really committed to constructing the speakeasy out of um, blankets and uh, light stands and camera things and various boxes and stuff that we had, I then had to be equally committed to making a cocktail menu. Um, so, so just as exhibit A, um, one of the only things that I picked up as a life skill in the last two weeks is learning, learning how to make cocktails. Um, it's actually become a thing in the last week, particularly where at the end of the day, it's quarantine time, and then I make a dirty vodka martini. We yes. love this! A quarantine, I'm going to have one of those, 6 p.m. sharp. I am also not at home. I'm, I'm, um, I'm staying in my my parents' house, oh. and my parents are staying in the house of some people they don't know very well in New Zealand, because they were on oh. holiday in New Zealand, and um, they weren't really paying attention, and suddenly they wow. couldn't get out of New Zealand. And then the other thing is my sister is a key worker. She um, is a nurse, and she has a little girl who is four, and so it's quite difficult for her at this moment because the schools are shut and they're That's only open it. for a couple of days. So I'm at the moment, I'm being kind of useful um, picking up my niece. Well, that, that sounds like actually useful, not just kind of useful. It's, it's well, useful. like, for, for example, she's at school today. She's at school today. Right. Um, so I'd, all I have to do is pick her up, you know. Yeah, and and I, I'm it not sure how useful I'm being. I got a warning, actually, on Saturday. Um, in the park, I, I got a, a warning. I, I was told that if I if I don't start playing properly, she will find another uncle. <laughs> yeah. I like her style. There are <laughs> lots of uncles out of work at the moment, so I'm sure somebody what else will make it. Well, I looked on the bedside cabinet. They're not no. there, as not you can there. see. And then well, I that... thought it must have fallen down the back of the bedside cabinet. But equally, there's nothing behind the bedside cabinet. Huh. Then I checked behind the headboard, and where I did find some moisturiser, I did not find glasses. Where I live, we've been seeing the best of, best of people and the worst of people, you know, like they're everywhere. Um, but one of the really good things, I think, is that um, there's now on all the wide walkways near to us, um, there's a, a, the council got a stencil and they've stenciled two stick people and then a two meters across the middle ah, so you genius. can see how far apart you have to be and it's a lot further than i thought mm. i hadn't i'd kind of miscalculated just how far two meters is yeah yes so, but that's yes. a real visible sign as well it's like a mark yes. like the landscape's been marked with this change Oh, do you think, and, and I suppose then we, you wonder whether it'll ever go back to normal or whether that will just be there as a sort of scar or a reminder of... I suspect of, they'll just get left there. Yes. Yeah. You know, and then years yes. to come, people will say, what's that? Yes. You know, why was that put there? So, yeah. Currently isolated with my ex-boyfriend. So. Ah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's a good time. It's How's that going? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's up and down, peaks and troughs, I'd say. It's uh, good days, bad days, mostly good. It's kind of fine. I feel like you just kind of have to get on with it, don't you? 
yeah. think it is weird regardless of situation for everybody right now. It's weird. Yeah. There is a base level of weird that it will always be anyway. Exactly. And I think I'm kind of, I'm, I'm happier not to be on my own. I think it would be, I would, I would not be, it would be weirder I think if I was on my own because I'm just in this flat and my flatmates in Scotland and neither of my parents want me to see them because they're both insanely anxious people who think that they're going to die. So if I, if I wasn't here, then I'd be alone. And that would be fun. So yeah. it's kind of fine. Yeah. In a way. Just so rubbish, to be honest. Mm. I feel like, I don't know that there's, I feel like I'm in a kind of nice limbo right now. And in a sense, this is like probably what, it's probably what I'd be doing anyway. Because my school's all cancelled and my degree's cancelled. <laughs> Not to get very depressing, but like everything's over. So I, I, there's not much to look forward to. My showcase has been cancelled. My shows have been cancelled. I'm not getting a master's anymore. I've cancelled that. It's so cancelled everything. I've cancelled everything. So as soon as this is over, it will just be coming to terms with the fact that everything's cancelled. And now I have to leave the house. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's just like, at the moment I'm playing Sims and I'm living many lives. I own a bunch of restaurants and I live on the beach and I've got like a million kids and they've all got great <laughs> stuff going on. So I feel like, I feel like I'm winning from this situation more than anyone else. And, you know, they- and I'm, I'm absolutely, I'm looking forward to the inevitable, like, Oh no, she froze. Oh no. The inevitable like what? The inevitable like. <laughs> it's got a magical piece of mystical. We'll never know. I've been in experiences as a younger person uh, for various reasons where I was isolated for, for, uh, for, for long periods of time. Um, and, and there is a, it is sort of mentally deleterious, you know, it is, it is, I think isolation is like the worst thing I've ever experienced for, for, for my mental health. And, and so, I mean, this was a time way before we had this kind of technology. So there wasn't a way of, I mean, as, as, as problematic as this is, it's, it's still, it's better than nothing. <laughs> you know, yeah. we, we are, we are connected in ways that we weren't, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And that's, that's kind of amazing. This uh, isolation stuff, you know, kind of, if you, if you keep busy, it's great. Uh, and if you, if you don't keep busy, then um, uh, that's when all these sort of fears and things come in. Because I'm 73, I fall into that category of, of uh, being vulnerable. You know, I, mean, I don't feel at all vulnerable because I'm physically and I've had no symptoms or, or anything else. But nevertheless, I've still sort of had to isolate myself. But what's really touched me um, last week when this thing really started to sort of kick in was um, I received various uh, texts and uh, you know, stuff on uh, Facebook from just people that, you know, recognised the fact that I am 73 and, and but supposedly I am uh, vulnerable. And it was just the very, very kind offers that they came through with it. It was like, John, if there's anything that you need at all, or anything you need getting, call, call us straight away, you know, we'll, we'll get it all sorted for you. Um, and I got it was something like nine different responses. Um, yeah, or not, not responses, nine different people contacted me on that. And mm-hmm. I just felt really, really moved by it. And the... The wonderful thing is, <laughs> or the strange thing is, um, seven out of those were boxers. Actually, something else I've learned is I've been doing yoga on, you know, using Zoom, and is that you can have a real connection with people. Mm. Um, lots of people who, you know, it's a live stream of a class, it's not a recording. Um, but you can have a real sense of connection, which surprised, it surprised me how deep that can yeah. can be and there's something really touching actually about you know 40 50 people in all these different places but doing the same thing at the same time mm. Mm. and of course you can see them all on the little teeny weeny thumbnails if you look yeah. which is quite uh, you know or you can you don't have to see that but 
there is something quite moving um, for me about that sort of shared shared endeavour, really. So everyone's a lot chattier and friendlier because um, you know this is zone one and people. I mean, they just don't talk to each other, um, and even even neighbours who have like little feuds and things with each other have decided to actually just sort of let go of that at least for the time being. I mean, it might be the post lockdown at all. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but for now, everyone's let go of these things. Um, people have been dropping notes around saying anyone who's in self isolation, they can support them. Um, I've been trying desperately to volunteer for any local organization that I can find. I spent hours looking and every single organization has emailed me back saying, actually we're inundated with volunteers um we just you know we we'll put you on our list so i'm on like gazillions of waiting lists now but you know i really went niche with it as well i was like oh what languages do i speak could i support this particular community or like you know i really went for it and all of them are absolutely full um wow. which i actually find just quite moving yes yes and it didn't i hear that the um the NHS volunteering scheme where they wanted 250,000 people had 750,000 people within about yes. three days. So that was the first place that I looked mm -hmm. and they, they've even closed the waiting list now. Wow. Um, so I'm, I'm signed up to receive alerts for when they open the waiting list again. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's amazing. So um, on the very first morning of lockdown official, I think everybody, felt very strange, a little bit excited perhaps that things were changing, but a bit bewildered. Um, the children were quite restless and my little one, um, Mabel, was thinking about all the things that we might be able to do together. And then there was a knock at the door. And when I went outside and looked at the front step, there was nobody there apart from an ice cream tub. And when we looked inside it, it was full of tadpoles in water. A little delivery of tadpoles have been put on our doorstep yeah. and a neighbour up the road who's a teacher had been gifted the school tadpoles to look after and to write a blog about and to share the stories with her class about how the tadpoles were changing and she thought it would be really lovely to share these tadpoles out she had an awful lot of them so each of the children all the families in our on our adjoining roads we've got a few roads that all kind of join up near Wandle Park we're given a little set of tadpoles in a different kind of container. So with huge excitement, we took the tadpoles in, we found an old goldfish bowl and we washed it out. Um, she'd sent us a link to how we could look at what was about to happen and how we should look after them. And we boiled up some lettuce and some broccoli, any of the green vegetables we had in the fridge. You have to boil them for 10 minutes and then put them into little ice cubes in the freezer so that we'd have enough food for the tadpoles if we couldn't get any more green vegetables. Um, and we've been watching these tadpoles. They've been in a goldfish bowl in the kitchen and they've been a kind of a, a, a tonic really to the Groundhog Day sense of this lockdown that every day we feed the tadpoles, we talk about them, we've got a tadpole diary and we're on day 18 now and the tadpoles are now there they've started off about this big and they're now growing to about this big and their tails are starting to shrink so we think we're going into a very exciting phase of the tadpole development they're coming up to the top of the water um starting to breathe rather than being at the bottom so this little act of kindness has given us a huge amount of joy so that's been an amazing thing and i think through the first few days and weeks of this lockdown when when time just seems to sort of stretch, doesn't it, and become meaningless. These tadpoles are really anchoring part of, of looking at change and nature. So, and then concurrently with that, with that tadpole thing in our lives, um, my, my father loves the Grim Fairy Tales and he always read them to us as children. And we started a Zoom bedtime story um, for all the grandchildren, wherever they are with him in the evenings at 7.30. And he's been reading the Grimm's fairy tales for them. And last night, it was the frog prince. So of course, there was a chat about the tadpoles and when the tadpoles were going to turn into frogs and were they really frogs or were they someone in an enchanted spell? So it's been a really rich time for thinking about old stories and then watching the tadpoles growing and changing on our kitchen table. 
so it's been pretty much Groundhog Day for two weeks, mm. um, trying to entertain my children and school them and all of that. And then uh, last weekend, so on Saturday, I was invited to DJ virtually for a, a virtual festival called Tentival, where mm. everybody put up a tent in their gardens and joined through WhatsApp and did funny things and there were cabaret acts and bands and DJs and we all took it in turns to perform. So I set up a kitchen disco and um, my husband, my partner was like cooking around us. The kids were running in, knocking over the decks, but I DJed and people that I didn't know all around the country were dancing in their gardens in front of their tents. And it was wow. quite a joyous, beautiful thing. And then in my infinite wisdom, I said to the kids, yes, sure, we can put up our, our tent. So we put up our tent and then they said, can we camp? Can we camp overnight? Can we go on holiday? And I said, yes, of course, little darlings. Um, but it was the 4th of April. So it was really, really, really quite cold. Mm. And yeah, we, we thought we were wearing quite a lot, but it wasn't yeah. enough. I then checked all of the coats I was wearing and jackets that day. So I checked this, the pocket here, nothing. I checked this that I was wearing in bed. Very nice. Thank you very much. I picked it up on my travels in Japan. Oh, I found them! <laughs> Did you suspect at any point your housemate? I outright accused her of stealing my glasses. What did you say? I said, have you seen my glasses? And she How said, no. And I went, well, there's no one else here. She was like, hmm. What's really getting me through, I think, the most is, is sharing love. It's an opportunity to share love. I love to share love. It edifies me. And this is a great time to do it because it really makes people's day and um, I shared love with a particular fellow spoken word poet of mine and it was really beautiful to hear his response back to me. He told me how emotional he was and how we teared up and how it just made him really, 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 really happy just to have someone take time just to appreciate him and all that he does and all the person he is. I didn't expect that reaction so it made me so, so happy and it made me quite emotional and overwhelmed just through doing that. So I think sharing love to different people and making different people's day who have really appreciated it. I think a lot of people are really down right now. Mm -hmm. So being able to make their day and make them smile makes me happy and keeps me going even more throughout this really weird, weird, weird period of time. Yes, mm. yes extremely weird. Uh, so, so what? So when you say you're uh, sharing the love, what, what exactly are you doing? Are you are you just calling people and and letting them know you're thinking of them? How how's it working? What are you actually doing? So it's a really simple thing. I go on Instagram and do stories because I was meant to be doing a show as part of Croydon Nights in Croydon called Love Warrior. And that didn't happen. And so leading up to that, every day I was choosing a different person to share love with, to on my story, speaking about them, if I have my life, sharing appreciation, letting them know that they're loved by me and talking about who they are, like if they're creative, telling people what they do. And so I've been going on Instagram, going on different stories, different person each day. And after the 28th happened, I was like, should I carry this on? And people were like, yeah. So I've been doing it on Instagram through the stories and tagging them in there with little love hearts. And then some of them will share it as well. So it's really simple, just a few minutes talking on Instagram, just about them and the impact they've had on my life and telling people why they should follow these amazing people that I know, because I'm blessed with an abundance of beautiful people. I think with the fear that's going around now um, and the, the way that people are coming together, I sincerely hope that that kind of bonding and camaraderie stays there where people are just being considerate to each other. And then um, as a little kid, I used to have to sometimes go to the shops for my mother or me and my older brother would go. And we'd have to take a ration book with us. Um, um, as soon as this has kicked in, I thought, I've actually been here before or a mm. time. Yes. Yes. You've, got, you've got the experience to get through it yeah. better than some yeah. of us probably have. Well, I, I mean, that's why the, it was so pleasant to, to, to feel this, this camaraderie that, that, that's uh, evolving everywhere. Mm. Mm. 
I, I get to like yesterday I went down to um, Sainsbury's, got to the edge of the road and the car speaks to some kids just, just to let me pass. I mean normally you, know, you have to fight your way across the roads, don't you? <laughs> the cars are stopping. You know. <laughs> I think I'm gonna keep this grey beard. I think the other thing that I've I've learned uh, to value even more, though I think I hope I valued him before, is is um the importance of, you know, um your neighbourhood and yes. um, I'm lucky I live in a really um, community minded road but also like small businesses and things like that I've tried to support them where possible and, and I hope that after this you know everyone will, will think about the businesses that treated their staff well and yeah. the businesses that didn't and um, you know unfortunately there are some that, that didn't and um, I hope, hope people remember that for a bit you know I hope they do. Well people said they finally understood why their like their grandparents would keep hiding food around the house and they were like, because of the war, because you didn't know. And it's sort of like, as soon as it's come to us, we're like, oh, okay, now I get it. Right, okay. Do yeah. you know, I'd not, I'd not really thought about that too much. Yeah. But actually, you're quite right. Yeah. Our, uh, any, any generation who is mm. experiencing this, I think we all afterwards will always have hand sanitizer and soap and toilet mm. roll in the house. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, not yeah. that not people didn't before, but, but no, but, but always like in a different way, we'll have them in the house. Yeah. I think. <laughs> also, this are we all going to are our children yeah, all going to why do you cough into your armpit? Yeah, <laughs> that's weird. Why do you cough like that? Well, it's, it's like the same thing now, like when we're watching television, you're like, those people are very close to each other, those people are touching. <laughs> it's like seeing people smoking indoors, where you're just like, that's that's odd. How quickly we've changed and just gone, no. No, not sure about that. <laughs> Go stand on the other side of the room. Okay, right, I'm on this boat. Um, my partner, Nick, and I uh, bought this boat. We had a survey and it all looked great. We were really excited. We'll live on a boat. How amazing that will be. And when we have a gig, we can take it to where we're going and it'll be really cool. And we'll go, oh, it's amazing. And we'll have dinner parties and have a lovely kind of, you know, middle class rosy view of what it might be to be on a boat and be, be a bohemian and all of that. Anyway, um, very soon after we bought it, uh, the survey turned out to be not worth the paper it's written on and the boat is an absolute lemon. So it just sort of became like the money pit, you know, that film. So it's just things going wrong with it all the time. And then eventually we brought it out of the water. So it comes out um, and we have nowhere to live. So we're sort of staying in his mum and dad's sometimes in my mum and dad's we're both 50 years of age you know what that can feel I mean you don't know because you're not that old but it just feels a bit like we're back to square one and what's going on and not always together because we're sort of trying to work at the same time and we're both moving around the country doing our thing it just just never stopped and and it got really bad and um and our mental health started to suffer and then uh, we were rehearsing for a concert in January in Harrogate. We were doing a concert there. And Nick suddenly, suddenly was, he was singing with the orchestra and he suddenly grabbed his head and he went, hang on, stop the orchestra, I don't feel very well. Um, and then he sank to his knees on the stage and then we got him off the stage and the orchestra's like, what's going on? And everybody, we all know each other very well. And um, ambulance come, eventually gets taken away. The upshot, the long, long, long story shortened is that um, he had had a burst aneurysm in his brain and so he was then in hospital in Leeds and he was there for five months from January to when did he move June beginning of June and um, so I stayed there and he, he had this aneurysm and then all kinds of horrible complications ventriculitis three times um, terrible things in ICU on a ventilator terrible really bad and they started to sort of come out of this kind of coma state in May and then they they moved him to a rehab place in Stoke-on-Trent so we all moved to Stoke-on-Trent his parents lived fairly near there so then for the next eight months I stayed in his mum and dad's spare bedroom they're lovely people but they are my in-laws. They're not my old people. Do you know what I mean? They're lovely, but anyway, so we were doing that and, you know, and Nick's making extremely slow progress, but progress, but slow progress. Um, 
And then they said it was time for him to move into a different kind of rehab that would be longer term. Nick's ex-wife became a really good friend. Anyway, I was telling her all this stuff was going on about this terrible boat. And she had the, she had the idea that it would be a really good idea to make the boat livable. So she kind of more or less grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and said, we're going to make this happen. And she did this whole GoFundMe thing. And all of our friends gave us loads of money. So we had loads of work done on the boat to make it livable. It's still awful, but it's livable. It's cold and it leaks a bit, but I can live on it. So I moved into it in, what month are we in now? Good God, yeah, we moved into it in January. And then they found this, this street, new stream of rehab for Nick. So they said it's in Birmingham. So we, I had the boat moved to Birmingham. And Nick moved there at the end of February. And so he's in this new place, really, really good, doing very well, starting to, um, he, he had very various awful disabilities that have occurred. Um, his cognitive ability isn't brilliant, but he knows who I am and he knows he loves me and he knows I love him. That kind of is enough for now. Um, but he doesn't know what day it is or where he is. I mean, he tries a different, where are you today, Nick? And he'll say, Manchester. I say, no, sweetheart, we're in Birmingham. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, what year is it? 2018 he's got up to. It was 2011 last week. So he has come a bit more up to date. So consequently, we're, we're, it's, it's, it's like doing this, literally, literally build, building a, a mountain out of sugar cubes. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to just, and little sugar cubes will fall away. But you know, yeah. The, the just mass of time and effort makes it gradually get bigger, but it takes an awfully long time. Um, but he's wonderful at the same time as, as awful. And if you transplanted me from December 2018 to his bedside now, I think I would fall over dead. I think I would, the shock. But the fact that you kind of go through it, he's my Nick and he's, he's still him. You know, there's still the essence of Nick, whatever that is, is yeah. still there. And and we love each other and that's weird because I mean it's very difficult to know what what's going on in Nick's head anyway so we're in Birmingham now we're in Birmingham and um and then of course they closed the place so I was with him for 10 hours a day for forever since he's been ill and now I'm not with him at all and we have to do this on Skype and his, his hearing isn't very good and he loses interest quite quickly. And, and, and if he can't see properly the screen for the, the sun shining on it or whatever, or if the uh, connection isn't very good, he will immediately lose. And so I feel like a bit like as though I've, uh, my world has become this boat and that nothing outside is real. It feels like everything outside is a fantasy. So yeah. I adore him and it's like he, it's like I am him and he is me. So half of me is missing. Mm. Oh, I didn't want to do that. But anyway, um, so I'm yeah, that's, that's... And I'm doing it too. So <laughs> even my story and I'm doing it. So. <laughs> he's, 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 he's my um, everything really. And uh, um, not being with him is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. <laughs> Oh, but all of this has been terrible and this is the hardest bit. Hopefully if this can be a time to reflect on what is important in life, because I think that's been forgotten quite a lot by loads of people. Yeah. Uh, and to focus, you'll focus on the things that are important and, and give them resources and give them attention and make them thrive. I, I, I'd like to think we would do that a little bit when this is all over. I don't know if we will, but I really hope we do. I really hope we do. It's living indoors and there's such chaos going on in places that I'm not a part of and that's what feels really odd. And you feel like you want to go there and help, but you don't know how much, I don't know what, what skills I could have that would be helpful there. And uh, my, one of my little boys is autistic, so it's, he's finding it really hard to stay in the house all the time. Um, so it's quite demanding being in here just because he has this need to get out and run. That's how he expresses himself is by running and we can't really do that at the moment. So it's a really strange thing. It is. The entire arts community is completely traumatized as well. Yeah. You know, I lost a year's work in like three days. I got yeah. taught, a year's tour dates just went, disappeared. Mm. And, 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 and most people I know are in exactly the same boat. 
So yeah. <laughs> like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> I yeah. guess this is the apocalypse then. <laughs> How will we all be when we come out of this? With you, we're, 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 I'm in quite a chaotic family situation where there's an awful lot going on and a dog to walk and a, you know, but people who are completely isolating and on their own with nothing it's, but a phone call, it's really hard. In fact, I, um, there's someone that I know who started hugging the tree in her garden to have a little bit of like contact with something because she's not seeing anybody or being physically sort of present with anybody and she said to me I'm not the kind of person to do this sort of thing you know but I really I need to feel like I can put my arms around something. The one thing that we've sort of asked people um, otherwise is what are you most looking forward to whenever life returns to whatever new shade of normal it is a small thing or a big thing for you that you are really looking forward to being able to do? Go swimming just go for a coffee with friends I think I think to go to a live performance. I can't wait to hug people again. Like I really miss being able to go out and hug people. I think human touch is so important to help us to feel connected and love. I really want to go out and have a big slap up meal and, um, yeah. and massively indulge myself. Definitely a hug. Yeah, I'm just going to go there straight off. That's what I'll do. And I'll carry on doing the things we do. Oh, I think probably working with the kids. You know, don't have to do you know, they get so much out of it. I think like a lot of us to actually have physical contact with people again, you know, hugs and handshakes. Oh, seeing my friends, seeing my family, just being together with people that you're physically separated from. But again, the first thing is just going around to my mum and dad's house and cracking open a bottle of wine and sitting with my folks and the kids having some soup and just having a nice time. Uh, maybe we'll meet uh, on the streets of Croydon at some date in the future when we're actually allowed to be yeah. face to face. I really hope so, it'll be lovely. Yes. Take care, Janiqua. Talk to you. Bye. Bye.